Hello everyone, Stakui here, and the reason why you have more than likely clicked on this video is because you are trying to understand precisely what has happened with Russia and Ukraine and really, what is it? Like, why have we gotten here to this point? And I'm hoping that in this video, I can explain to you just a bit of the brief history that has occurred over the past several decades between Russia and Ukraine to why it is that we have gotten here to this point. So things all began in 1991 when Ukraine became independent from Russia. Russia, of course, at this point was the leader of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And so shortly after the fall, Ukraine voted for independence. Once it became independent, Ukraine at that point was the second largest country in Europe by landmass, and simultaneously it had an exceptionally large Russian population in it, a sizable minority, if you will. Then on December 5th, 1994, the Budapest Memorandum was signed. So this was a document that was signed following Ukraine's agreement to transfer all nuclear weapons from the Cold War to the Russian Federation, which in turn made Ukraine a non-nuclear power. But prior to this, Ukraine had physical possession of the world's third largest nuclear stockpile. In addition to Ukraine, the Budapest Memorandum was signed by the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia. All the signatories committed to honoring Ukraine's sovereignty to its rights and to its territory. And so then if we fast forward another decade into 2004, that's when we start to see some election trouble and really where some issues between Ukraine and Russia begin. So 2004 was basically the presidential election between two victors. On one side, you had Viktor Yushchenko, who was a more Western-oriented candidate, and then on the other side, you had Viktor Yanukovych, who was supported by Russia, which in turn created this massive controversy. You see, Yushchenko was mysteriously poisoned before the election, but he was able to recover in time. Victory was declared in favor of Yanukovych, but the election as a whole was seen as fraudulent. Ukrainians took to the streets wearing orange, which was Yushchenko's campaign color, and by December, protesters were able to force a revote, which actually resulted in a victory for Yushchenko. So in early April of 2008, a NATO summit began with a very intense debate about extending a membership action plan, or MAP, to Ukraine. The gist of it is that in order to join NATO in the first place, you need a MAP. Which, I guess you have to find your membership that way, but that, that's basically the gist of how it is that it works. And if you don't know what NATO is, NATO is a military alliance between 28 European countries and two North American countries that are dedicated to preserving peace and security in the North Atlantic area. NATO was something that was essentially founded back during the Cold War in an effort to contain Russia, which at that point was the Soviet Union. It has been used much in the same way to contain modern-day Russia. Which is something that Russia is blatantly aware of and has made it very clear that they do not like the idea. At one point, Putin even stated to George W. Bush that Ukraine isn't even a real nation. And that was back in 2008. NATO thus did not offer Ukraine a map at the time. And so all of this is posturing, but things really begin to get serious in 2013. So if you recall that Yanukovych person from earlier, he actually came back in 2010 and ran for president again. This time, he won on a platform in which he was pledging more support towards the European Union. But after promising to work towards a relationship with the European Union, he changes political direction and begins to orient Ukraine more towards Russia. And so this, combined with the controversial arrest of political opponents, really sparked widespread protests about perceived government corruption. There were protests across the country in an event known as Euromaidan, which centered on Maidan Square in Kiev. At least 130 people, primarily civilians, were killed during these protests. And as a result, Yanukovych just flees to Russia. The new leadership that comes into power then commits to orienting Ukraine towards the European Union and Western sentiment instead. So with their pro-Russian ally out of power in Ukraine, Russia then has to do something a little bit more drastic and step in more personally. So then in 2014, Russia seizes Crimea, which is the Ukrainian peninsula to the south that has a predominantly large ethnic Russian population. In the aftermath of the Yermaiden protests, Russian troops occupy key sides of the peninsula, wearing military uniforms that have had the Russian insignias removed, the entire time denying that they are actually involved, that it instead is the movement of separatists. The annexation prompts international outrage and is then condemned by the United Nations as well as the European Union. Almost at the same time in 2014, what then happens is that in the Donbass region, Russian-backed separatists rise up in the Donetsk and Luhansk territories, creating, respectively, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. 
which in turn created a civil war that Ukraine has effectively been fighting to this very day. So then on April 21st, 2019, Volodymyr Zelensky, who was an actual formal comedian, overwhelmingly defeated the pro-Russian incumbent Petro Poroshenko in the presidential election. Zelensky's party also goes on to win a majority of the seats in parliament, which was a first time ever for this to occur in Ukrainian history. Zelensky promised in his campaign that he would end the war with Russia and would root out corruption in the Ukrainian government. But not necessarily all that much happens for two more years. They're effectively in the same kind of status quo and constant state of civil war. But then things really begin to change in 2021 when Zelensky started to crack down on pro-Russian Ukrainian oligarchs, including the likes of Viktor Medvedchuk, who was a close friend of Putin. Subsequently, Putin then deploys increasing number of troops near the Ukrainian border and starts to publish articles claiming that Russians and Ukrainians are actually one people, effectively setting the stage for a united country. By December, tens of thousands of Russian troops are deployed on the border, and Putin issues demands to NATO and to the United States. Among these demands is that Ukraine is never to be admitted to NATO, which was a request that was denied by the Biden administration. Now, if you recall those separatist regions of Donetsk and Luhansk earlier, the entire time that they have existed, they never received any kind of international recognition or anything like that, just that they were backed by the Russians. Though covertly, the Russians never came to outright admit it. And so that effectively goes on for eight years until February 21st, 2022. After talks between NATO and Putin break down, he instead declares that the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk are formally recognized by the Russian Federation. He then decides to send in troops to keep the peace. Which brings us to where we are this week. On February 24th, Putin officially orders an invasion of Ukraine. So only a few days after recognizing the breakaway territories, Russia then launches a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, claiming it to be nothing more than a military operation to keep the peace. The invasion began in the eastern parts of Ukrainian territory in Donbass. Zelensky then declared martial law in Ukraine and officially broke all diplomatic ties with Russia. Putin's actions were condemned across the world and sanctions have put in place. But... As of making this video, which I'm recording on February 25th, nothing has been done in terms of military action. And so that brings us to where we are here today. Now, I'm making this right now on the evening of February 26th, 2022, and what it is that I'm about to say is the sequence of events that we have seen so far going from the time that the invasion started on February 24th going until now. On February 24th, the invasion approximately began around 3 a.m., when Russian President Vladimir Putin announced in a pre-recorded television broadcast that he had ordered a special military operation in eastern Ukraine. Only minutes later, missile strikes occurred at dozens of different cities across the country, including Ukraine's capital of Kiev. At the same time, Ukrainian border service stated that shortly after this occurred, that its border posts with Russia and Belarus were under attack. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky then declared martial law around 3 a.m. Within about half an hour, Russian forces reportedly encircled the city of Konotop and put it under siege. But despite Russian attempts to capture Konotop, the city held out and Russian forces were repelled. The next day, Russian equipment could be seen on the morning of February 25th, burning in the streets. By 4 p.m., Russian helicopter troops had captured Anatov Airport. However, a later Ukrainian counteroffensive would successfully recapture the airport and destroy the Russian landing force. However, around an hour later, Russian forces then captured the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and the abandoned city of Pripyat. That night, the State Border Guard Service of Ukraine announced that Russian forces had captured Snake Island and the Black Sea following naval and air bombardments. What happened here on Snake Island is that 13 Ukrainian soldiers refused to surrender to the Russian warships that showed up. When they were told, surrender or be fired upon, the reported response was, Russian warships, go F yourself. None of them survived. And so in the early morning of February 25th, President Zelensky had ordered a full mobilization of the Ukrainian military for 90 days. He then announced that all Ukrainian males who were aged between 18 to 60 were banned from leaving the country. Every man would do his duty and fight. By 8 a.m., the Russian army had reached Kherson, and then half an hour later, the Russian army unblocked the North Crimean Canal, which restored water supply to Crimea. This had been lost back in 2014, following the Russian annexation of Crimea itself. At approximately 10.30 a.m., Russian forces then entered Melitopol. The city was shelled and street fighting ensued. 
Melitopol's leadership surrendered later in the day, and the city then officially came under Russian control. By mid-morning of February 25th, Russian troops and armor had reached the northern districts of Kiev, whereupon the Ukrainian government urged its citizens to make Molotov cocktails. Fighting then continued through the streets over the course of the day, leading into today. And so around midnight, going into the early morning hours of February 26th, heavy fighting was reported to the south of Kiev near the city of Vaskulev, with multiple reports stating that Russian transport planes had been shot down, but there is nothing to verify this necessarily. Around 3 a.m., more than 48 explosions in 30 minutes were reported around Kiev, as the Ukrainian military was reported to be fighting near the CHP-6 power station in the northern neighborhood of Troisinia. The BBC reported the attack may have been an attempt to cut off electricity to the city, but we don't know. Heavy fighting was reported near Kiev Zoo and the Shulukva neighborhood. Early on the 26th of February, the Ukrainian military had said that it repelled a Russian attack on an army base located on the Pemrovia Avenue, which was a main road in Kiev. It also claims to have repelled a Russian assault on the city of Mekhaliv on the Black Sea. And that brings us to where we are here today. I'm recording this now at 7 p.m. here on February 26th, 2022. I will provide more updates in the future as it is that I know more. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have anything that you want to ask or know, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you everyone for watching. Goodbye.